From trash to high tech, in Benin, startup turns old jerrycans and recycled components into affordable computers. In order to vaccinate 10% of the Nigerian population by the end of December, the World Health Organization urges Nigeria to scale up vaccination for COVID-19. Hello and thanks for tuning into the show that goes around the continent to bring you stories near and far. I'm Chamberlain Osoa, Channels Television here in Lagos. I'm joined by Vincent Macquarie from Voice of America in Washington. Thanks. I'm Vincent Macquarie at The Voice of America. Happy to be with you again for another edition of Africa 54. Our broadcast here looks a little different because of the global pandemic, but we truly appreciate you staying with us on Africa 54. Let's start off with the latest from Nigeria. Channels Television in Lagos brings you that story. The World Health Organization is urging the Nigerian government to scale up vaccination for COVID-19. WHO country representative Walter Mulombo made this known at the bi-weekly briefing in Abuja saying this is in order to reach the 10% target set by the WHO by the end of December. The bi-weekly briefing on the ongoing COVID-19 vaccination exercise by the National Primary Health Care Development Agency begins with the executive director giving an update on the vaccination coverage. According to him, over 4.9 million people have been vaccinated in Nigeria, representing 4.4% of the targeted eligible population. However, only a little above 2.1 million of the vaccinated population have received their second doses, representing 1.9% of the eligible population that has been fully vaccinated. He also commented on the latest travel protocol by the United Kingdom and how it affects Nigerians traveling to the UK. Nigeria's status has not changed. Nigeria is not among the red-listed countries that need to mandatorily quarantine for 14 days in a supervised UK facility. We must... The country representative of the World Health Organization urges the government to scale up vaccination for COVID-19 in order to reach the 40% target set by the WHO by the end of December. WHO has set a target of 10% of uh, the population vaccinated by end of September and 40% by end of December this year. So we would like to urge the, the Nigerian government to the NPSDA and with your collaboration to scale up vaccination, to speed up, to reach that target. And for Nigeria has a targeted population of 101.7 million eligible people to be vaccinated. But so far, the country has only fully vaccinated a little above 2.1 million people. Joining us now is Dr. Akela Ishaku, who is a public health expert and the molecular virologist to discuss these matters. Thank you for joining us on Africa 54. Let's begin with the level of awareness in the country. Do you think that there's been enough enlightenment regarding people going to get their job? I think... Um we have done considerably well. There is enough enlightenment. It's just that we are defaced with uh, a lot of misinformation, a lot of uh, fake news, a lot of uh, information surrounding vaccines. So it behoves on us uh, as a people and also as a government to do more, to counter most of this misinformation and misleading uh, you know, information surrounding vaccines. So uh, uh, we just need a well-coordinated and robust um, um, advocacy to counter most of these heresies surrounding COVID-19 vaccine. We also need uh, government agencies like national orientation agencies to take these parts upon themselves to intensify uh, more campaign strategy on uh, vaccine optic that this will go a long way. We also need um, a lot of uh, stakeholders' involvement in these regards. Um, the Chamberlain, I'm thinking that by now we would have had COVID-19 ambassador, which you should be one of them, 
So we should be able to identify people that um, have done well during this pandemic and then designate them as COVID-19 ambassadors, just like the way we had polio ambassadors. These people like celebrities can go a long way in pushing for uh, a lot of advocacy regarding COVID-19. Well, in addition to that, um, is there a chance that perhaps an increase in vaccine doses and maybe having more, uh, making them available in more centers will get people vaccinated? Because as it stands, we we'll barely reach the 10% capacity recommended by the WHO. You are absolutely right. Nigeria have not done well in reaching up to the 10% recommended WHO uh, threshold uh, target. Uh, having the vaccine in most of the centers will go a long way to increase accessibility and uptake of these vaccines. But it will also go a long way if we think outside the box, but also giving incentive for people that have taken the job. So in the coming days to come, I thinking that we should have a framework to support and to encourage uh, uptake of vaccine through giving incentive. Secondly, it will also be good for us to actually have a mandatory threshold uh, of vaccine certificates for things like employment, things like if you are traveling out of the country, you need to have a vaccine certificate. I think as a country, we have reached this stage now. This is because we need to protect the health well-being of uh, uh, the nation, because for a healthy nation, definitely the, uh, the, 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 the citizens needs to be healthy. So I strongly believe that once we have these uh, policies on ground, uh, thank God that Nigeria just had its own vaccine policy launched last week. Once we have these policies on ground, it will go a long way for us to meet up with the target. So I agree with you having these vaccines at centers, it will go a very long way for us to actually increase the uptake of the job. We can also see to how we can stimulate with incentive and also make a mandatory vaccine certificates for people traveling outside the country to be able to meet up with the targets. So why do we then place this? Because even with the number of doses available, many are still hesitant, thereby hampering that target. What more can be done to scale up this vaccination? Yeah, we actually need a robust um, uh, communication. Sincerely speaking, uh, vaccine hesitancy has become very, very dominant and recalcitrant even among health workers. We have done a lot of surveys to, to, to check why is it that we have a lot of hesitancy even among health workers. Talk more of the market woman in Kawaranamuda or Elisha or in Inewi. So what we just need to do is that we need a robust stakeholders engagement and a continuous advocacy. Uh, there is no end to advocacy. We need to do a continuous robust advocacy so that we can be able to achieve these targets. Once we do that with a sustained advocacy, we should be able to attain or achieve these targets. All right, then, Dr. Akiala Ishaku, thank you for talking to us today. Thank you for having me. Donkey owners in Kenya are demanding a permanent ban on the slaughter of the animals after a court lifted a temporary ban earlier this year. They say their donkeys are being stolen and killed to meet a demand for beauty products and so-called medicine in China. Victoria Amunga reports from Nairobi. Kinampe Sampare is taking stock of his remaining herd of donkeys, making sure none have been taken. He says he did not worry about losing his animals a year ago during a government order that shut down donkey slaughterhouses. But since July, six of his donkeys have disappeared from his land. Sampare is convinced it's because the temporary ban on donkey slaughter was lifted in May, allowing the meat and hides to be sold again in Asian markets. When the donkey factory was closed, the theft had stopped. It had stopped because since then, no donkey was lost until recently, when six of my donkeys were stolen and my neighbours two donkeys. Tens of thousands of donkey owners like Sampare are demanding a fresh and permanent ban on donkey slaughter in Kenya. In a petition, some 30,000 owners from 28 counties said their animals are vulnerable to theft from poachers. 
Activists say the donkeys are being sold on the Chinese market where they used to make beauty products and so-called medicines. Animal rights groups are calling for regional ban on donkey slaughter. But we also had a chance as ANAO and as members of the Association of Donkey Welfare Organizations in Kenya this year to discuss with members of IALA, the East Africa Legislative Assembly, the need to have this removed, not just from Kenyan laws, but all over East Africa. Because the moment you allow donkey slaughter in Tanzania and you stop it in Kenya, the donkeys will move across the border and come. Kenyan authorities have appealed court ruling in May that lifted the previous ban, but as donkey owners wait a decision on the appeal due in October, state officials say they're not ready to open the donkey slaughterhouses. Yes, it has been lifted by the court, but in terms of uh, administrative, we feel that uh, uh, we cannot just go by the, what the court has said. We said we have no problem. We have not stopped them from slaughtering, but we are saying our inspectors will not inspect. And until you show us evidence that you are in the production systems of donkeys and therefore there is need for you to slaughter. National figures show in 2019 there were an estimated 1.7 million donkeys in Kenya. Victoria Amunga for VOA News, Nairobi. South African clothing giant, the Foshini Group, along with other industry players, have unveiled a project called Threaded Together. Partnering with the Vocational School for the Deaf, 150 students are deepening their skills at a new factory in Johannesburg. The Minister for Trade and Industry and Competition, Ibrahim Patel, says it's all in the line with the country's increased localization of the textile and allied industry, as well as inclusion of usually excluded groupings. Our South Africa Bureau Chief, Betty Dibia, has the story. And with the tape cutting, the doors open to a factory filled with opportunities for some groupings often excluded from economic participation. Everyone in this factory is hearing impaired and there is plan for more inclusion of more factories and more people with disabilities. A chance meeting at a conference gave birth to this. The gentleman came to see me, he was from St. Vincent's, the School of the Deaf, and he said, don't we want to come and have a look? And we put a classroom together with sewing machines for the students, never to build a factory. But they adapted so well. I mean, these deaf kids were doing better than hearing kids. So when they graduated, they had no jobs. So they, they couldn't get jobs because normal clothing factories are not going to employ them. So we decided to build a factory for them. We also brought in a number of other big corporates to help put this facility together. Um, so this is very much a joint project by Corporate South Africa. This initiative is also a byproduct of the Trade and Industry Department's Retail Clothing, Textile, Footwear, Leather Master Plan, which set a target to grow retail sales from 165 billion rand in 2016 to 250 billion by 2030, with local share increased to 65% while creating over 300,000 jobs. Today's event is about helping to create job opportunities. It's about promoting economic inclusion, supporting the localization efforts of business, of the unions, of community organizations, and of government. It's about skills development, about boosting confidence. No, your sound is not faulty. Guests here were led into what the world feels like to the hearing impaired when excluded from participating in societal goings on. The students here who have done a three-month theoretical study at their school are glad to practicalize what they've learned. Honestly, I feel like we need to empower other countries also. They need to get deaf people to work and um, to be employed. Hopefully, your net prayers for more inclusion will be heard for many hearing impaired people around the world. And for the Threaded Together project, the TFG group and their allies say five more centers are on the cards in South Africa. From Johannesburg, South Africa, Betty Dibia, Channels Television News. It's time now for a short break. As we do, we'll remind you to visit our website, channelstv.com, for news and programming around the clock. You can also find us at youtube.com forward slash channels web. Still to come, trained by Kung Fu masters in China, action movie fighter Manisuru Kiza spreads his love.
for the sport and coaches Ugandan youths in martial arts. Welcome back to Africa 54. I'm Vincent McCory in Washington. Biolab, a startup in Benin, is converting plastic jerry cans into computers using recycled components and distributing them to the public at a low cost. And Zeukeo visited this startup in Cotonou, Benin, in this story, narrated by Moki Edwin Kinteka. Artu Dadjo is a student in Cotonou, Benin, where innovation and recycling meet. For the past year, he has been using a computer he made himself. It is made from a plastic jerry can assembled with recycled materials and parts from an old or broken computer to build what would become the computer's motherboard and hard drive. Locals call it jerry after the name for the containers. With royalty-free software installed, it is as good as new and, most importantly, cheaper. You can find a complete office computer between 300 and 350,000 in West African CFA franc. But with the components we bought with the help of the startup, we spent about 100 to 150,000 to have this computer. Biolab makes these Jerry computers a digital innovation lab working in the fields of education and digital technology. The startup regularly organizes workshops to teach people how to make their own computers for free. The trainers say in addition to giving people access to cost-effective products, they want to help develop skills in innovation. The second objective is to stimulate creativity in children, because when they learn to do these jerrys, they learn to be able to solve the problems they are confronted with in their environment, using the material or the means they have at their disposal. The training to learn how to build a jerry is offered for free. But participants have to find the components to build their own computers themselves. Biolab has been in operation for four years and founders say that hundreds of people have already taken advantage of the training sessions and built their computer. The startup is now working to make these self-built computers available to schools located in remote areas. With that, Biolab says it could bridge the digital gap one jerry at a time. For Anne Zwanke in Kutunu Benin, Moki, Edwin Kinzaka, for VOA News. Ugandan martial artist Manisuru Kiza started out watching other fighters as a teenager, training with Kung Fu masters in China and even featuring in action movies. Now, He's coaching youngsters, hoping to follow his footsteps or even be better than him one day. Every morning and evening, children get to punch, sprint and push up at the Kimen Lee Fitness Club in Wakiso District, Central Uganda. They are students of 30-year-old Manisuru Kiza, who fell in love with the martial arts form after watching Jet Li movies as a teenager. Kiza runs a club in his backyard, where he trains children aged between 5 and 16 years. Many students are girls, encouraged by their parents to gain self-defense skills. I decided, no, these girls, they need to get what they call self-defense, so that they can at least fight for themselves. If you come and attack her, if you want to, to, to rape her, she will, get, she will be able to defend herself. That's why you see they are practicing, yes. And also to keep their body, to be physically fit and also to have Power. Kiza grew up in an informal settlement in Kampala and says he had to learn at an early age to ward off muggers. The Kung Fu master says he wants his students to live in similar neighborhoods to learn skills that can help them protect themselves. Kiza says he had 25 students before the pandemic, but the numbers have since dropped. The classes are free of charge. Among students on the program is Kiza's five-year-old daughter, Asfi Nakilija. 
I plan to use the techniques I have learned to defend myself from those who may want to kidnap and use me for sacrifice. When I am fit and ready, I will be able to fight off the wrong people and save myself. Kiza, who previously trained in kickboxing, became so skilled that by 2009 he started starring in movies made by Wakaliwood, a Ugandan low-budget action film company. Who killed Captain Alex? Wakaliwood's biggest film has nearly 6.5 million views on YouTube. In 2017, Kiza traveled to China to train with experts. The father of four, who is also a part-time painter, has high hopes for his students. What I need from Kung Fu in Uganda, I need at least to get. Even if one person can go and uh, compete uh, in the Olympics, World Olympics, I think it will be very, very better for me. And I will never, I will never give up until Kung Fu reaches on top. Kung Fu is not presently an Olympic sport, but promoters are fighting for its inclusion. It is an event at the Youth Olympic Games. Burkina Faso's war against Islamist militants has seen security forces criticized for human rights abuses. The battle to win hearts and minds has moved to a new stage, with soldier singers using their talents to promote the armed forces. Claire McDougall reports from Ouagadougou, Burkina Faso. Police Sergeant Yakuba Sarabia, known by his stage name General Yak, is one of 15 Burkina Bay soldiers who sing about battlefield life, loss and fighting the enemy. These singing soldiers hope their music videos will win public support in the war against Islamist militants and put the military in a better light. The song is dedicated to our soldiers, our defence and security forces who are on the front lines and even those who have lost their lives. We have dedicated this song to our soldiers to make them understand that they are our heroes. They are valiant men of the nation and for their families to be encouraged because families have lost their brothers and men on the front line. Burkina Bay director San Remy Traore was motivated to make music videos with security forces because his brother is a policeman. He also wants to encourage greater confidence in the military. The first is to show the force of the soldiers on the terrain in this battle, but it's also to assure the population so they understand they can count on the people on the battlefield who are there to defend the national cause. But critics say security forces should focus less on promoting fighting and more on respecting civilians' rights. And this kind of music can boost the morale of the troops, but on the other hand, one must also consider human rights and the respect for social cohesion between the community and all Burkina Bay citizens. mission important is to construire la solidarité, l'égalité entre les citoyens burkinabés. For gendarme duo Le Creux, their latest song, The Patriot, is about all of society fighting terrorism. The final refrain of this song is, we will not move, we are here. And it seems Burkina Faso's soldier singers are here to stay. Claire McDougall for VOA News, Ouagadougou, Burkina Faso. And that's our show for today. You can find all the continent's top news and world news online at voaafrica.com. Check it out. I'm Vincent McCory in Washington. Charles Television has our last word from Lagos. We look forward to bringing you another show next week. ChannelStV.com is your source for news and other programming. I'm Chamberlain Usar. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.